The IPA have talked a lot in the past about emotional campaigns outperform rational ones, but the actual number of cases is quite small. And so therefore, this has become something where people can actually say, you know what, the style of advertising which I kind of feel is probably right, I now know is. So it added some empirical evidence to a gut feel that a lot of marketeers had. I think the thing that really pulled John Lewis um, above the other papers is not just about the emotional gorgeousness of, um, of the idea and what they tapped into, actually, it's that the power of that idea allowed that campaign to work so forcefully. The genius is both in the emotional core of the idea, but also how it uses TV and social platforms together. John Lewis is deceptive because it feels like a big brand it isn't. 2009 it had about 26 shops, it's got 36 now, but we're talking 36 versus Marks and Spencers in the four or five hundred, so it's a small business. So John Lewis is this uh, unusual, uh, unique place, which is defined by the fact that there's a partnership. So everyone in the business uh, owns the business. There are no shares, but we all share the profits. It's been around 150 years next year. It was pretty revolutionary when it was created. Um, the thought of taking a business and handing it over to its owners was revolutionary then, and actually it's revolutionary now. That's why the service is so good. That is why the, the staff are so engaged. Most of them have been there for a long time. However, the downside for a marketeer is they're much more forensic about how they spend their budget and what's the appropriate marketing that they want to put for the face of their business. John Lewis didn't have a board marketing director for most of its history because marketing wasn't at the top of its priority list. Um, that has changed. So in terms of what led us to the emotional strategy, pre-2006 it was very rational, it was very print heavy, it was very product focused. And then the first two or three years that we had the business, uh, it was still more product rational focus. It was at that point where we realised that you know John Lewis did have the potential of being far more emotional and it took a lot of faith uh, within the John Lewis board to sign it off um, but we needed to make that shift because we knew that John Lewis was very emotionally important in people's lives. 2009 was a dark period, I mean we're sitting here in 2013 it's not a lot better actually but it was the beginning of a difficult time and John Lewis was not well positioned because it was, it was a middle income, fairly premium store. That is a recipe for disaster. And a lot of John Lewis's competitors have gone bust. And the list is depressing to read because they're famous names that went out of business within about 18 months. So going forward, John Lewis was staring down the barrel of some very, very difficult sales periods. And Andy Street, the, the, the MD, was very, very clear that John Lewis were facing some bleak years ahead. The truth is, they haven't. The business problem for John Lewis is very simple, which is within its catchment areas, it had very high penetration. Everyone had been, and a lot of people had been in the last 18 months, but they went once. So John Lewis had a limited relevance to an awful lot of customers, and that's what's holding it back. It wasn't they didn't visit, they just didn't shop it broadly enough. You know, we sell 350,000 products. Most of them you either put in your home or on your body, so they're inherently emotional. And also, we are there for all the kind of key emotional moments in life, whether that's babies or weddings or moving house and all those things. So it felt like there was a natural territory here. So a real sense that actually there was an opportunity if we could connect on a more emotional level. So we've got two main strands of communication. Uh, Christmas is key, it will always be key, uh, and then never known undersold. And that's really the underpinning for our entire strategy. That's the the guarantee that customers have that they will always get great value from us. We sort of battle plan creatively at the start of the year. So where have we been? Where do we think other people will think we're going to go? Where should we go? And, and Never Known Under Sold has always been used as the less tear jerky, slightly more fashion-y, slightly more not in the heartland. That's where we can make people feel a bit uncomfortable and, oh, is that should John Lewis be doing, do, doing that? And then Christmas returns more, more to the, the emotional territory. So they're, they're, they're tough ads to do because you're sailing at the front and you're not doing what people are expecting you to do. Well, the KPIs we needed to apply were really clear from the challenge that we had. So it was 
about driving frequency, so we just needed people to visit a little bit more. And also we needed to acquire some new people, so get new people into the brand. Um, and, and, th and that was also really clear. And that's still true today. Uh, there's a natural frequency and acquisition rate that department stores have, and we needed to get beyond what that natural rate was. There were sort of four real key foundations for us uh, from a media point of view. One was uh, increased investment, so we needed commitment from the business in terms of investing more behind it. The second one is the longer time lengths um, that again were created um, because of all the case studies that we'd seen. Uh, so the third point is about high profile programming um, and making sure it's seen at the right time by the right people. Um, and getting the awareness up as quickly as possible. And then the fourth point uh, is basically around using and harnessing the power of social media, which again was a very powerful tool for us to use. So Christmas is so important because it's 40% of the company's revenue. I think 20% of the profit is driven in the five weeks over Christmas. So it's a vital part of any retailer's business, uh, that short window of opportunity. Christmas advertising is a of a type, especially for retailers. You tend to get a medium level celebrity, think Mylene class, you stick her in some kind of Santa Claus outfit with a bit of fake snow and she gives out a load of gifts. John Lewis isn't like that. And it's partly not like that because when you go in the stores, it's a calm, quiet, reflective experience. So the ads themselves are designed to make people think a little bit more about what Christmas is all about and what great gifting is all about. And that is reflective of the overall strategy for Christmas at John Lewis, which is about thoughtful gifting. So they can buy a more surprising, more perfect, more absolutely spot on gift at John Lewis than they can elsewhere, because there's simply more to choose from. So this isn't to say it's the thought that counts. It's saying for people who put a bit more thought into the perfect present, John Lewis is the place to go. Well, there's no more emotional time than Christmas. Christmas is special for all the reasons that are obvious, but uh, and, and therefore, John Lewis's role at Christmas is greater. Um, if someone shops with us once in a year, it's, it will be at Christmas. Uh, that's the time where we, we really come into our own. And so creating that positioning around the home for thoughtful giving was incredibly important to, to our strategy. But it also has a second importance, which is it, it ends one year and therefore it carries over into the next. If John Lewis has a good Christmas, it starts the next year with the wind in its sails, the partners feel positive. So the first time we articulated this new emotional platform was in Christmas 2009, where we created our first campaign. It picks up on, on, a, on an insight of giving. In this case, actually, it, of receiving, which is that no matter how old you are, if the, if the present is perfect, for a moment you feel like a child again. You know, you can be a 55-year-old man, but if you get the perfect jumper, you'll put it on that day, which is what you used to do as a child. You want to wear it now. So I thought the idea was, was pure and reflected the truth about the brand that we were trying to communicate. What I remember a feeling is probably most remembered for is the music. It was a re-recording of Sweet Child of Mine by Guns N' Roses. It was quite difficult to get, but we got it. It felt like it might be a little bit out there for the John Lewis brand, but then of course we saw the take on it that, that Taken by Trees created, uh, and, and it entirely changed it. And of course, uh, we've carried on with that ever since. Childhood memories when everything was as bright as the blue sky. We found the power of having the, the music in the charts at Christmas was huge because every time it was played, every time it was bought, it was like people remembered the ad all over again. It, it doubled or tripled our airplay, if you like, for nothing. And therefore, the music has become an absolutely crucial part of every piece of John Lewis advertising ever since Guns N' Roses said yes. Never Knownly Undersold is the premise that John Lewis will always be there for price, quality and service. John Lewis wanted to be there and be the most trusted retailer on the high street. And during a recession, a beacon of permanence is enormously attractive to people because they say times are tough, things are changing, but something doesn't. And they, they warm to that. And therefore what we wanted to say was a, was a double hit of we are permanent, we're always here, we're established, we don't change and we're always here for the times in your life that really are the high points. 
Well, we did Christmas 2009, and in many ways, when I look back, that felt like a, a kind of easy in to this emotional strategy. It was relatively um, safe because we used kids. Uh, then we took on Never and Only Undersold, and actually harder to get to in many ways. It's not as obvious as Christmas. Yeah, Always a Woman was came out of a, a quite simple process, I think, which was we wrote a lot of not very good sort of mobile phone style big ads which felt like they could be for anybody and we were slightly baffled and we went and had a good meeting with Craig and, and the guys and the relationship is such that we're able to say this is where we are this is how I feel about you know and they responded as well and we had a very open and honest discussion and really I knew it was going to be about a life I knew it was about that sort of nose to tail start to finish and then it was a question of doing that that John Lewis is there for you at all of those stages you know you you get your kids nursery stuff from there you have your wedding list there and everything in the middle and everything to the left and to the and to the right and Ben and Emma and Matt and Steve worked on this sort of transition this single take it was also very demanding in that there was a 90 second version of it and there was a 60 second version of it and unlike normal jobs where you just edit a different version each scene had to be a correct length so when you added them together they hit 60 and hit 90 so there were two ads to be shot which is why we had upstairs at Blink with Ben and Emma pretending to be babies and husbands and wives because we had to time each scene and do a 60 and a 90 version of her going to the fridge or... or, or. So yeah it was but then that's again Dougal is one of the few people who is technically capable of delivering it and then still making you cry at the end of it. And that's a difficult combo that he does brilliantly. The creation of the ad is one of those examples of a great piece of marketing that involved limited thought, which is, it simply was, there is a story that we're here for the high points in life and that story's never been told, so let's tell it. We agonised over the ad in some respects because it, we, we worried that it was too perfect. However, we have to accept that we're, we're, we're targeting existing customers for John Lewis and it, John Lewis' existing customer base have led lives like that much more so than their children will and even if they haven't led lives like that would wish they had or would wish that for their family and so we went with a fairly standard way through life and that is why it works so well. I think we were all slightly surprised by the response but virtually every journalist's angle on it was that's the life I wish for my children and that is why it makes you cry. And that is why it became so popular. Well, one of the reasons I think we were successful with this campaign is we hadn't actually shared it very much. And then I was presented with the finished version. It was too late, as it always is. And uh, someone ran into a conference with a DVD at lunchtime. It was a supplier conference, 500 people in the room. And we presented it. And we just saw this incredible wave of emotion, I mean, in the room. Uh, I mean, pe literally people crying uh, from our supply base. You know, these are hardened chief execs, not not. Um, people who are prone to emotion, and uh, and so we knew at that point that we were onto a winner. All she will do is throw shadows at you, but she's always a woman to me. So the always a woman experience was 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 a fraught and quite a tense and quite a, a, a difficult one, and then. The ad went out there and then within 48 hours it was just, it was like a forest fire. It went sort of supernova. It was every newspaper, everyone you'd ever met, Twitter, Facebook, music, YouTube. And, and that's the great thing about our, our business now is when you do something like that, you, you get the most amazing thing back. And when you do something that's rubbish, you get nothing back and you know and you go and have a word with yourself. But when you do something that connects with people, um, you get this avalanche from every direction and it's that's uh, that's that's probably the most exciting thing about our job nowadays I, I would say it's a little bit funny so for those who care it was a, a natural step on from the previous christmas where we would use kids and this time it was about actually bringing it back more into the kind of adult world and and how it feels to really care for the person that you're giving so it started the evolution of the strategy towards it can more about giving oh, if I did. Again, we tried to take an iconic track, and I think probably this is where we had our most success because Ellie Goulding had started to become known within within the UK, and actually this was a real platform for her. And she re-released her album and so on, and the track went on to be used in the Royal Wedding. So it was probably the point at which our musical strategy kind of really started to, to motor and, and reach a peak.
So Through the Ages was in many ways the difficult second album because we'd done Always a Woman, which was our first attempt at Never Knowing the Undersold. And then the question was, what do we do next? And so we wanted to kind of draw on the on a similar theme in the sense that we had had longevity through people's lives, but to do it in a very different way. And the idea was to take music and specifically the role that technology had played in people's lives um, over the course of the last 30 years or so to, to bring that to life. Okay, guys. Yeah, we're all right. The key John Lewis pieces of handwriting that we've developed for them are an understatement, not screaming and shouting at people, and uh, a truth or an insight. You know, Christmas is, was best when you were a kid. John Lewis is there at every stage of your life. So building from an unarguable truth. Music has become, in a very unscientific and unplanned way, a very key part uh, uh, of the, the TV handwriting. And, and I think the way that, th that, that things are filmed, we've used a small stable of the same directors so that we keep a visual a look. And as an agency, we've tried to get out of the way so you can't see Adam and Eve. What you can see is there's the consumer and there's John Lewis and there's a direct line of the love affair. And we're not in the way kind of dancing and trying to be clever. So there was two uh, key insights, I guess, as well, that fueled our, our media plan. Um, the first was uh, the sharing, uh, so the law of sharing. Uh, around the sociability of uh, the commercial and the programming that we were looking to, to go into. Uh, and we knew that was a very powerful tool if we could harness it in the right way. The second key insight was uh, the importance of the first view. So it's a build on the recency theory, um, but we knew that if we could get such a powerful creative out as soon as possible, as quickly as possible, to as many people as possible, then the campaign could take on a life of itself uh, and be shared in so many different forms, which again, if we can evaluate the power of that, which I think we've done very well in the, in the case study, shows the benefit of great advertising. So Christmas 2011, uh, I remember sitting in a room with Adam and Eve about February, March time, thinking, right, <laughs> that's two in the bag, gone really well, where do we go next? And we had quite a tough time getting there. Um, we went through quite a few ideas and then eventually we landed on this idea, um, which became The Long Wait. The Long Wait was one of those scripts that the second we saw it, we thought there's something in this. Actually, there is an absolute, even bigger joy in giving than there is in receiving, as demonstrated through child. And it's not always at Christmas, but occasionally kids do surprise you by doing something enormously thoughtful. When they do, that is overwhelmingly appealing. That parental pride in that is huge. The long wait taps into that. Um, and the other thing about it is it's just entirely simple. It's a very simple, nicely observed, very short story of a little boy waiting for Christmas. And I guess my worry was maybe it was too simple. Maybe it was just too simple an idea, and it was all about the performance of the actor. And of course, the rest is history. We, we ended up finding just the perfect person. And so it was really all in Diggle's casting that that, that ad was as, as successful as it was. The creative, Ben went and filmed it and edited it, and Ben came back and press play, and we sat and watched the long way entirely as you saw it on the telly. There was no fundamental changes at all. Please, please. You don't realise at the time, but when you're making something that's going to go that stellar, it's a series of hurdles, and you have to drum all ten of them perfectly. And you never know what number you're at, and when you d fail to do that, you never realise, oh, we've just knocked number five, and that means we don't get ten out of ten. Out of 10. And, and the long wait was, could we have a brilliant two-line script that's just a fabulous idea? We went over the first one. Can we get Dougal to do it? Because it's going to need to be beautiful, but it's going to need to have a... Can we find this little boy in Scotland who's... What about the track? Well, we had the track from when we did Sweet Child of Mine, and it just wasn't quite right, and we knew it was perfect for that. And But we had to leap the ten fences, and we, we were really lucky in that we managed to do that, and everything just fell into place, and it was just easy. It was a brilliant idea with a brilliant director and a brilliant track, and we just sat there and watched it all get put together. And at the end, I went to the meeting and played it to Peter and Craig, and they said, what do you think? And I said, it's the best thing we've ever done for you. And it was. 
So I never believed that, that always women would ever be overtaken in terms of the reaction and, and I was on record saying that in many different circumstances but actually uh, the long way did just that. Uh, there was an incredible reaction to, to Lewis and his performance, but also the message and the spirit of what we were trying to say, the fact that it was so focused on giving with a lovely twist at the end, and, and the reaction was just phenomenal. So Christmas 2012 was the difficult fourth album, uh, and so the pressure was really piling on. And um, I, I guess where we were was, was look, how do we continue with this core thought of thoughtful giving? Because that's a real truism, it's never going to go away, but put a fresh twist on it. And having had such a great performance from Lewis the year before, it needed to be something quite different. So The Snowman was presented and in the end it was a bit of a leap of faith because we couldn't see whether it was going to work until we shot it, really. And, and of course it had had massive success and I, and I think though that um, the techniques aside the reason it was successful was was still about authenticity it was still about the fact that a story was being told which was rooted in an emotional truth about about Christmas and the speed at which people viewed snowman was because we'd made ads before but in order to get to I don't know what it's at now four million views or something like that it has to have some sort of quality of its own otherwise no one's no one hopefully is that bored that they're just checking out John Lewis ads for the sake of it Yes, yeah, so the opening weekend for John Lewis is, is probably the most important part of any campaign. We've got to a stage now where we are sharing the commercial with uh, fans and uh, advocates of John Lewis um, 24 hours before on YouTube and Twitter and Facebook um, to the point where we'd had uh, a million views in the first weekend on YouTube, which is fantastic. We have to create an emotional message and there is no other media that comes close to, to sharing an emotional message as there is with television. And that's not just because of film. You can make you can put film on the web, but it's consumed solely and individually, and often on a small screen. And you lean forward in your bedroom upstairs, and therefore you enjoy it. But it doesn't have that looking across at your husband or wife or kids and having that moment of reflection that you do when you see a television ad. And television, therefore, still stands apart as the most emotional media. Watching Always a Woman during the X Factor is more powerful than if you're watching it during Cash in the Attic during the day. And the ad campaigns came out right when a lot of big programming was at its height. Then you factor in the fact that everyone's tweeting and twittering about programming above all. Then you've got this almost perfect storm of, of television being more emotional than it's ever been, of advertising having an opportunity to capture and sort of springboard off that emotion, and then people sitting on their laptops telling all their mates about something they just saw. We were trending globally on Twitter uh, in the first weekend. That's been very good because ultimately John Lewis will have international link. Uh, expansion ambitions and therefore just to get a little bit of name recognition is not a bad thing. And then it's building on that to making sure that you know the rest of the campaign is as strong as what we've given the first weekend as a launch. We do a lot of nice big TV ads but at the heart of the television ad is an idea so the print starts to talk a lot more about people who care about X or people who care about Y or whether it's electronics through the ages the print then goes on to celebrate the electronics through the ages so the print doesn't mirror the TV it builds onto the TV to create a much bigger picture. Our pride in giving them a handwriting is just as important in print and posters and stuff that ends up in store as it is on TV and it was a big part of our pitch. We built them a frame, a frame that went round everything and then we built them a, a piece of design about never known the undersold quality service and price which went at the end of the TV ad and went in the corner of the print and poster ads goes on all the tags in store the windows and stuff like that but it all has a handwriting and it's all got a look and a, and, a, and a feel rather than being schizophrenic. And so we invested in 
uh, high production values. We, we knew that we needed to get greater consistency across all of our print media and to really elevate the product and be reverential towards the product. And that's the way that we look at it within John Lewis. And so it was how do you bring that to life through print? The thing about the John Lewis success story is that it's a success by any measure. So if it's a success by just pure sales, then John Lewis had an unbelievable run of sales and it's continuing to do. It's record week after record week for three years. If the measure is sharing, sociability, that sense of making a buzz, then John Lewis marketing is the most talked about, the most shared that there has been for the last four or five years. My favourite measure is cultural. The fact that we have church sermons and school assemblies dedicated to the contents of a television ad is just incredible. It just demonstrates the kind of cultural hot buttons that the marketing is hitting. And finally, if the, if the measure is do the partners like it, then it's another box enormously ticked because uh, the partners who have always been a bit sniffy about marketing and, and unsure as to whether it really did build their bonus. And the bonus at John Lewis is important because that's why, what makes them different. Uh, are now going, you know, please, where's the next piece of marketing because I know that it does and I love it and I love the fact that everyone in the stop shop comes in and starts talking about it and I've never felt prouder to be part of John Lewis. So John Lewis uh, advertising has generated over a thousand million for the partnership and again over the period of the paper since 2009 uh, from a profit point of view uh, that's over £260 million pounds worth of incremental profit back to the business, uh, which we can demonstrate has been driven by the advertising. The actual investment that we put behind the commercials and the campaign was over doubled in terms of what was shared and, uh, and played out with it within the market. For me, um, the importance was delivering against the objectives that we set out originally, uh, which was getting more customers to shop at John Lewis, um, and that was up 10%. And the other thing was getting increased spend through the existing customers, which again was up 6%. But some of our key competitors, such as uh, Marks and Spencers, Argos, Next, we're all posting year-on-year uh, -year declines, which goes to show that the 6% doesn't sound huge, but in the climate and what the competitors were delivering was a massive result for John Lewis and a real success story. We saw, in terms of profit, uh, for every pound that was invested uh, in marketing, five pounds of profit was delivered back. And if you isolate just the TV campaigns on their own, they were up to £10 worth of profit for every pound invested. So one of the key measures uh, for the campaign is how more likely you are to shop at John Lewis. And Millwood Brown uh, estimated, and it's been quite consistent over the campaigns that we've run, around 67, 68% of consumers are more likely to shop at John Lewis versus a retail norm of, of sub 50%. One of the things that I would never have expected is that the music in itself would give us a return. And it returned uh, just under £15 million in its own right. And we've had lots of musical success, which has been great for the artists, but also great for our brand. And indeed, uh, in Christmas 2012, we, we got our first official chart number one. So the final measure of success with John Lewis is partners' bonuses. It's public, it's announced every year, and it's in all the papers. And uh, across the period of the campaign, partners got bonuses that range from 14% to 18%. That is a significant amount of money. Well, a clear lesson for me, and I think potentially for other marketeers, is the need for authenticity. And you know that's what's really struck home. If you look at any of the research we've got from customers, it's they really believe this. You know, they get to the end of the commercial and they don't feel disappointed. Actually, they say, "Yeah, I can believe that about John Lewis because it's true in the brand promise. It's true in my experience uh, with the business, and therefore the advertising rings true." I think one of the successes of the, the, the John Lewis story has been the collaboration of the teams uh, that work on the business. Obviously Craig and his uh, big marketing team, um, as well as Adam and Eve and ourselves and other agencies that have been heavily involved. They've put their money where their mouth is, their necks on the lines, and we've worked very closely with them to make sure that they weren't let down. But uh, a huge amount of credit goes to them for vision, investment, instinct for the brand, courage hiring an agency of 15 people in an appalling building in Covent Garden at the pitch stage, you know. and uh, So I think it's a massive credit to them. 
There is a team that have kind of been together over, over this period. You know, there's been some changes in personnel, but overall there's been one team. And I, I, I think that has been part of the specialness that we've created, primarily because it's allowed us to have the type of relationships which allow us to be incredibly blunt with each other. So we do have lots of argy bargy uh, and it get, does get quite tense and we've definitely had our moments. But by doing that, we, it allows us to get to the best possible work. John Lewis is a powerful brand because people trust it to give them what they want. So the campaign builds on what people already believe about the brand and then takes it to not just emotionally powerful places, but intuitively powerful places where you believe only John Lewis can satisfy that. Because obviously there are other stores where you can buy other presents, but you, you do believe if you go to John Lewis, you are more likely to get Christmas right. And that's something people absolutely care about. And I think the campaign is fantastic in the way it understands that and puts it across. The IPA Grand Prix, as a creative director, is a massive, massive award and a massive deal for me because it proves that work that is deemed to be creative has a huge commercial impact and that is what we're here for. Whatever anyone else tells you, that is what we're here for. John Lewis Marketing wouldn't be deemed a success unless it succeeded against our primary objective. So all, everything else it's achieved is nice. But we're not about nice to have, we're about need to have. And we needed to have more of our customers visiting more frequently and spending more when they came in. And very clearly, across the, the years of the paper, an increase in, in number of visits has been marked. And then the increase in average spend per visit, which is very easy to measure, has been marked. And those are the minimal base camp success criteria that we had to meet. And I think the campaign has excelled, excelled at doing that. It's been groundbreaking in terms of what it's done for the partners, for the business, for marketing, uh, for ourselves and the people that have been involved in it. So it's now how do we continue that on um, and, and continue driving the success of the John Lewis business. So uh, it's been a lovely journey to be on and, and, and when I reflect on how things have changed internally within John Lewis, there's a, a much greater sense of what the brand is. Um, and much more talk about the brand and the importance of the brand so you know I'm very proud of that but to have gone from frankly quite a skeptical audience and, and rightly so you know the partners own the business they've got every right to hold people like me to account um, to where we are now which is partners actively looking forward to what the next installment is going to be I think it, it adds pressure I often get asked about the pressure actually it's a really nice pressure because because it's a more of an anticipation and excitement than it is raw pressure. So it's been great to be part of that and uh, I'm really proud of the fact that marketing now plays a much more central role in the business than, than it did five years ago. And you can tell everybody this is a song